Hello Internet, today I wanted to take a look at troicoidal waves. Um, so these are, these are waves that are used to simulate oceans usually, or just bodies of water. Uh, and they do a pretty good job, and they're pretty simple to implement. So we're going to we're gonna do like a really basic implementation of this to kind of demonstrate the idea. Uh, and then if you want to take this further, you, you, you can. Um, so this is sort of an example from Freya Holmer. Um, she's a streamer on Twitch and does a lot of game, game development stuff and is very awesome at graphics stuff. Um, so I'll leave a link to her stream in the, in the description. Um, but this is sort of a, a really basic example. The idea is effectively, instead of having your points and moving them up and down, you move them in a circle. Uh, and by moving them in a circle, you create points that condense and points that spread out. And that causes this, this wave effect. And you can kind of alter that. Um, and then this can be expanded for actual depth. And you can uh, use this example here to introduce depth to the, the, the simulation so that the further down you go into the, in the, in the water, the smaller the circle that you're rotating around is going to be. And so what I'm hoping to do here is just implement a really basic surface shader that does this. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna be working with a Unity surface shader, and then we're gonna be adding a vertex shader on top of it. Um, most of what we do isn't actually gonna happen in the surface shader itself. We're gonna be focusing on the vertex shader. Um, going into hope what shaders are, I guess, you have two main types. You have a vertex shader and a fragment shader. A vertex shader is going to be the, th the thing that actually defines where the object is. Um, so if we have this cup here, um, this is like your object in this case. And so if you have multiple of these cups, you are going to have any number of them. And they could be anywhere in, in your house or in, in the world or wherever. And so the idea is this is one object and every single one of these objects is, is the same. Um, ignoring any, any like broken things or whatever, the, assume they're all the same. The idea of a vertex shader is to take that object that is all the same and figure out where to place it inside of your world. So you can, you can take a template effectively and place it wherever you need it. Um, and effectively it's telling your, your camera what to draw. Um, in this case, we need to we need to do some things to actually modify what this looks like inside of that based on the position in the world. Um, and then the fragment shader is what is actually telling you how this looks. So given the position of the thing, how does it interact with all the other things in the scene? How does it interact with the lighting and how does it interact with the camera and things like that? Uh, and so those are sort of the two main components that that operate. Um, vertex shaders operate on the vertices of your mesh. And then fragment shaders operate on all of the pixels in between. Um, they're called fragment shaders because not pixel shaders typically, because with a fragment shader, um, you might get multiple fragment shaders shading the same pixel. Um, so like if we, if I put this in front of my face, um, if we draw my face and then we draw this mug, uh, we just filled that pixel twice. And so it's not really coloring the pixel, it's coloring the fragment and then potentially being overwritten. Um, so just, I, I, I don't, it's not something that I'm super familiar with, with why it's called that. But anyway, we're going to implement this. Uh, and I will, I will leave links to all of this stuff here. Um, I do have some notes over, over off to the side. Uh, just so I remember the syntax for how to do vertex shaders in surface shaders, um, because I, I, I don't <laughs> remember it. So we're just going to go here. This is just a, this is actually my platforming uh, project. We're not going to be doing anything with platforming, but uh, it's a project, so we're going to use it. We want, uh, I forgot how to spell it, wave. <laughs> That's probably wrong, um, but uh, I'll fix it. Uh, I'll, try to, I'll try to link the code to this uh, so you can go and grab it. Um, it's probably just going to be uh, Fairly straightforward. I might just show the vertex shader, and you can implement it into whatever fragment stuff you want. Because I'm not. I, my goal is not to touch this. Um, so this is the surface shader. The difference between a surface shader and a fragment shader that I was talking about earlier is surface shader is something that Unity introduced, and it it, it sits. It's an abstraction on top of fragment shaders, and it includes a lot of the standard lighting stuff that Unity does for you. 
Um, so instead of specifying an output of a 3D, uh, like a RGB color, you are outputting the albedo, which is like a color, uh, a base color. And then you're also outputting like emiss emissive colors and whether the object is metallic or smooth or if it has an alpha transparency. You're, you're outputting like properties of the thing, of the surface, rather than the color of the surface. And then Unity kind of does things with that value to make it look right in your scene. Um, so the, the advantage of using a surface shader versus a fragment shader in Unity is you get it to work properly with lighting in your scene. If you just used a fragment shader, you wouldn't get lighting without adding it, and you, you'd miss out on all those goodies. Um, so we need to add a vertex shader. And so I'm just using the uh, basic samples off of Unity's surface shader site. That's pretty much all we need to get started. And really all I'm using it for is just uh, for the syntax because I don't remember it. And the syntax is different between vertex shaders for vertex fragment shaders versus uh, vertex surface shaders. Um, so this will look slightly different depending on what you do. Um, so we are going to create this vert function. Um, the name of this doesn't matter, just like the name of this surf doesn't matter. Um, those are specified here. So in this case, we have surface surf, um, and that's telling Unity there is a surface shader with the function name of surf. And so as long as those two match, it's going to work. Uh, and the same goes for vertex shaders. We just need to specify that there's a vertex shader, and it's named vert. Um, I don't think we need shadows for this, but we'll We'll leave everything and pretend like it's going to be fine. Uh, this syntax highlighting is uh, not an official support thing. Um, so you might see things not be highlighted in the way that you expect. Um, that's typically fine. We shouldn't, hopefully, see any errors here, unless I've, I've screwed something up. Um, the only error we have is the amount, uh, because this is using an amount to offset uh, based off of the the meshes normals. We're not going to do that. Um, so we don't need to do that. <laughs> there we go. Uh, we can just make this a no op actually. Done. All right. Um, so what we want here is actually to grab our world position. Uh, and so to do that, uh, I, should, I should probably cover why we want the world position. Um, the idea that I'm hoping to hoping to do here is to base th this effect off of the world position of the mesh on a specific single dimension. Um, so we're going to probably use the x-axis. And so as vertices move along the x-axis, they're going to modify where we are along this wave. And so there, there's a few things that are going to happen. We're going to effectively be moving in a circle. And the further along that x-axis you are, the further around that circle you have, you, you've gone. Um, and so effectively, we're just going to coil it more and more and more the further along you go. Uh, so there might be some problems with that, that approach, uh, but we're going to ignore them. <laughs> um, that's not a good, good solution to this, but we're, we're, that's what we're going to do. Um, so I think we can just modify this vertex. And this is going to be different than how it is for a vertex frag shader. Um, anyway, uh, we'll see what happens here. But I, just to test, uh, we're going to do v.vertex.xyz plus equals uh, float3. And I am going to transform this up one. And the reason I'm doing this is because I am curious. We talked about object and world space. I am curious what space this is in. And so one way we can test this, hopefully, is by applying a material to this. Uh, that's not a material. There we go. Uh, wave material there. And so we can just drag this there and assign it to our cube. And you'll see the cube jumps up. And so it's in normal unit space, which is what we expect. But we should, if we can modify this, then we are in object space, if that makes sense. Uh, because I just rotated the cube, and it rotated in in the full world space. Um, so by moving it up, we didn't move it up in the, in the world. We moved it up relative to itself. Uh, and that tells me that since we're in object space, we need to transform from object to world space in order to do this calculation based on world space. 
Uh, so that's just an easy way. This is probably documented somewhere. Uh, but since I didn't know and I, I didn't bother to find the documentation, we're just going to do it that way. Um, so what we need to do is take this value here and multiply it by something in order to get world space. And so to do that, we're just going to have a float three, float four, float three. I don't know what we want of world space. Um, and we're just going to say that's equal to the multiplication of that vector times a hard coded thing that's going to be uh, unity object uh, to world. And so this matrix transforms an object from object space into this. Um, that there isn't a special matrix that exists that does that for every object. Unity is providing this matrix in this shader specific to that object. Um, and so this is going to be calculated by Unity and provided to us. So that gives us that value. And then if we want to do v.vertex.xyz, that's not going to work. <laughs> um, we can, just to demo this, I guess, we can do this. Uh, we can do float three of uh, the correctly, there we go, <laughs> correctly done thing. And so this should be our up vector in world space. And so it's no longer an object space, it's relative to the world. And so if we do this now, I should be able to rotate this on like say the z-axis and this, the origin of this cube should not move because we are translating it up relative to itself. What? <laughs> um, I'll eat my words and then be very confused. Why didn't that work? Object to world, that seems correct. Okay, I don't understand. Oh, uh, we might need world to object. Because I want to, I, this is ob, world space, sorry. Uh, on the right side is, is world space coordinates. And we want to get that into object space coordinates, which is what this left-hand side of this function is expecting. And so we need to translate that up, up in world space in, back into something that the object space can use. And so now uh, I should be able to reset this. There we go. And so our cube is now sitting on top of the other cube. And as I rotate this, it stays at its origin, if that makes more sense. Anyway, um, that was kind of a, a tangent, but it, it's useful for what we're doing because we're, we're actually using this, this, these coordinate systems to do this effect. And so with this world space, we are going to need some sort of modification and we're actually going to need this as well. Because what we're going to be doing is figuring out some sort of transformation of each of these vertices, and we're going to need to apply that in, in world space in order to modify it. And this will allow us to like rotate our river or whatever we're doing and still get this effect to apply to it and hopefully get something that makes a little bit of sense. Not super sure if you're actually going to ever need to rotate this, but this is going to make it an option, so why not? Um, the world space coordinates that we've calculated here are only going to be used inside of our calculation. We're not going to take this and return it anywhere or provide it anywhere. We just need to calculate our offset. And so to start, I guess we just need an X value because we're going to be modifying two coordinates of our thing. We're effectively creating a plane for our object to rotate on. So we're creating some plane for our circle to exist on, and then we're just going to create a rotation around it. Um, and so the easy thing is uh, rotations are, are pretty easy. It's just cosine and sine. Uh, so we need a rotated offset. Uh, sure, why not? And we'll just create that as a basic float three for now. Um, this probably isn't required, but we're, we're doing it anyway, uh, just to be more explicit about what, what this actually is. And because it's just a habit from all the other C sharp stuff that I do. Um, <clears throat> right. So we have the rotated offset. Let's take this and then we need to calculate two values. And so what we're going to need is this time value. Uh, time is provided by unity as well. And it's going to have four dimensions. Um, the one we care about is the X dimension, but the other ones are multiplied versions of that. 
that are going to have different values depending on different things. Um, and that's done just so that you get a constant thing. So you don't need to constant, like if you're trying to use time in your fragment shader, for every pixel that was on your screen, every fragment that was on your screen that you were going to draw to, you would need to calculate that value. And so by giving you those extra pre-calculated versions, you don't need to do that. Um, so sometimes that's helpful, sometimes it's not. Um, so we're just going to use this time and plug it into a sine function. Uh, so rotated offset dot x equals the uh, sine of time dot x times some sort of radius. Uh, so we're just going to plug in one here, but I'm going to leave that there because that's actually going to be, we're going to pull that out into a property later. Uh, and so this time dot x is also going to be multiplied by something. I'm going to multiply by five. This is just going to be the speed of this fun uh, function. So by increasing this, we're going to go around our circle faster. And that's just going to increase whatever we're doing. Uh, the problem with this, we're doing everything the same. So every single value in this function is going to be offset the same amount. What we want to do is add some sort of offset here, which is where the world space comes in. So we can add this world space dot X uh, and multiply it by some other offset value. And so this is going to rotate us around a circle, a set amount based on distance. And so the further or the larger we make this, the more around the circle you, you, you'll you rotate. Um, and it's gonna, how the effect looks is gonna depend on like the vertex density and all this other stuff. Um, but this gives you a nice way to kind of change how it looks so you get a different value across time. And we'll just give it 10 here. So all three of these values here are going to be pulled out at a later time. And we're going to use them as a way to kind of uh, give us information, I guess, about this. Um, so we have some sort of offset. We have some sort of, uh, I, I guess this is the offset. This is our radius. And this is our time delta. Uh, and so those three values are sort of what's going to determine the output that we actually get from this. Um, this does one dimension, but the other dimension is pretty much the same. Uh, so before we actually do that, we can just plug our rotated offset into this function. And we should get some modified vertices out or an error. We can get an error too. Um, unexpected identifier of V. Uh, yes, we need a semicolon. There we go. And so <laughs> we probably have, what this is telling me is we have too much information here, uh, but it looks somewhat useful. Um, it's probably more useful if I swap this out for a plane. Uh, because you'll actually be able to see what's happening and we'll actually see the vertices kind of condense in certain sp spots and then expand in other spots. Uh, it's still a little bit small in this case, but it, it gives us the information we need. Um, so that kind of tells us that we're on the right path. We probably just have different wrong values that we don't necessarily want for this constants. But when we make those properties, it, it doesn't matter. So uh, let's do the other one and we should get something more interesting. So we can just plug that into the Y. Um, so this is again working on a plane. We're doing X and Y. If we wanted to rotate this, we would need to do a little bit more work um, to actually transform this into along whatever axis we wanted. But because we're just working with one specific axis, this works fine. Um, we don't need to change any of the other values though. We should just need to change this to a cosine and a sine. That gets us the circle bit, and then everything else should be good. So now <laughs> we get this, uh, and it becomes very obvious, one, that everything is spinning in circles, and two, that uh, we chose the wrong values. Uh, but it's close enough for us to actually be like, OK, that might might be correct. <laughs> um, so let's swap these out for an offset. Uh, sorry, a, a delta speed, I guess. This will be our offset. And this will be our radius. And so there's two places we need to define each of those. Uh, one, uh, this isn't this isn't one of the two, is right here. <laughs> um, the other two are going to be up here. 
And this is going to tell our shader that these values exist. Um, so we're going to say float of delta speed, a float of offset, and a float of our radius. And so that's actually exposing these in our shader. That's giving it a place for them to store the values and then actually consume this. But if we want to actually do something with this, if we want Unity to be able to expose this in its property editor for its shaders, we need to come up here and actually add a property. If we don't do that, we can still set these values using code, but Unity isn't going to know they exist. Um, so we would actually have to manually go in and set these. Uh, otherwise, we just come up here and give them the name. Um, so we have our radius, and it's a float with a default of one, I guess. <laughs> and then we have our offset, which is an offset. <laughs> That's also a float. And we'll just set that to one again. And then we have our delta speed. Uh, don't know if that's a good name for it, but that's what we're calling it. And then that's also a float with a value of one, I guess. Uh, this is the only place where there isn't, I mean, there's a few other places like here, uh, but there's no semicolons here just because, um, but that should be everything we need that hopefully will give us the ability to actually modify this. And one seems like a much saner value. We can speed that up. Uh, you'll notice as I change the speed, because this is actually based off of the entire time, um, that x value is actually the entire time from zero into infinity. Uh, and that can have some interesting implications. In this case, it, it can mean that we, uh, if we change this, we're not changing it by like an increment. It doesn't mean that the next value is going to increase slightly more. It means that over the entire span, say we ran it for 100 seconds, if we increase it by 0.1, we just increase the entire simulation by one second because we increased it by however much over that entire span of time. Um, so it's going to be cumulative, a cumulative change. Um, and so it's not something that you, with this implementation, it's not something that you can change in real time. Um, at least not without getting weird effects. But in this case, here's what it ends up looking like. Um, I found, because uh, I actually <laughs> actually recorded this earlier, uh, and it, it didn't go as well. Um, you do it using negative one or negative values gets you the points on the top. And so we can we can change these to kind of get different values. As we increase this offset, the size of our waves is going to get bigger and as we also they're going to get smoother as you can see but as we uh that's not right um as we increase this rather we get uh more choppiness because we're getting more circles happening in a smaller distance um, and then as we lower this the amount of change between each of our vertices is much smaller so we get these larger swells that you can kind of see happening here. Um, I'm going to go and insert tessellation into this because I think that would be handy. Um, there's not anything fancy. Unity provides tessellation functions for this. Um, so there's nothing for me really to show. I'm just going to add that and we're going to extend this a little bit, um, which is easy enough to do in here. So let's do that. Also moving this will change your output because we're based on world space. Um, which is a handy thing to know. Um, okay, fine. <laughs> Wait. Oh. Why is that? That doesn't seem right. Oh. We rotated our, our cube. But that doesn't make sense. These should align... And they don't. Uh, something else might be going on because that doesn't seem right at all. I'm going to drop these cubes quick. Uh, and I may have screwed something up. That do that's indicating something weird is going on to me. Uh, because it's based on world space, right? And so if world space is working, <laughs> um, 
they should just align with one another as they're moved apart. And they're not. Even if, even with the way these waves are working, like with how shallow they are, they should align because the the vertices along that x point should have the same value they should have the same x value and they clearly don't because we're getting two different results and it looks like that world space thing is not world space um <laughs> Because we're getting the same curve on both of these. Um, so this function is wrong. It, right? That, that would be what that would that would be indicating. Because otherwise we'd be getting the same thing. So is this not right? Can I just do this? That doesn't seem right. Yeah, I thought so. Okay. And and okay, so I, I should step back. There's a few things going on here. One, I think this this function is correct. I'm pretty sure that's correct. Um don't know about these, but I'm suspect of the world space. Um and the reason is because we're getting the same output here which means that the inputs into these two functions are the same for both of our both of our things um, or at least the outputs are the same of, from both of these functions and for those outputs to be the same uh, either we need to have some crazy coincidence happening or something else uh, and I don't think something else is happening because <laughs> we can change this and you, you can see that as I do, the same function is happening in both. Um, and even if I increase the time delta or something like that, we get the same thing. Uh, so I'm guessing this world space is not what we thought it was, or at least not what I thought it was. Um, so let's plug in v.vertex. Does that change anything? It does. OK. Uh, I, I don't actually know how to explain why that fixed it. Um, there's a there's a fourth coordinate and and apparently that was required um, in order to fix this. But there you go. Why that worked though, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but oh, what's it called? Hegemonic? The, so the uh, this matrix is a four by four matrix, which means it accepts four dimensional vectors. And so we were plugging in a three dimensional vector and getting the wrong results. Uh, and I'm casting it back to a three dimensional vector, but that we only need the, those three. Um, but the the assumption that I had when I looked at that was that we should probably try not using the, the three dimensional vector. So remove the swizzle operator. Um, that's what this is called, this XYZ. It's called the swizzle operator because you don't need to type XYZ. You can type ZYX or uh, ZXY or uh, YXZ or any any other combination. It, it lets you kind of transform the function however you want. Um, uh, I removed that and that gave us this and then we got the right result. <laughs> That, that isn't very helpful. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure I'm the best person to explain why that changed. Uh, so I'm gonna leave it there, and and I guess uh, you could look at you could look up matrix multiplication for four dimensional vectors, I guess. Uh, and I just deleted something, but uh, hegemonic, I think, is the the word. There's some there's some value for the when multiplying a 3D vector into a 4x4 four four matrix, the, the fourth value has significance on what, whether it's a zero or some other value. Uh, and that can actually influence things. And so I think that's what was happening here. But I don't know enough about 
any of this to be able to tell you if that's actually the case. Uh, and yeah, that's 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 the best I know. Anyway, we're gonna go back and do the tessellation thing because that's gonna help with this. So uh, we have the tessellation shader added in. I just used a, an edge length tessellation shader just based off of Unity's thing. If you're not familiar with it, it does the same thing as the vertex shader. You declare it the same way. Uh, and you just need to add all the things. Uh, it requires a tessellation include so that it actually knows what the function is. Um, and we're, the function that it needs is is this one, the Unity edge length based tessellation. Uh, and then I just needed to change out the app data for app data full, which is already defined. So we didn't need a, a separate app data thing just floating around. That didn't make a lot of sense. So we're reusing the one that we already had. Uh, but this gets us much more detail, so we get much smoother uh, waves, and so we should be able to do something like this, uh, yeah, and get some nice like ocean swells or something like nice waves. Um, we could probably do some more with this to get it uh, giving us a little bit more of a uh, wave, I guess. But I guess for like basic ocean stuff. This will probably do it. Um, and for, for other water stuff, you can just tweak a few of these values to kind of get it. But anyway, I thought this was a pretty easy way to do like water style stuff. Um, and just to check um, before I do that. Yeah, okay. Lighting still works. Um, that was the only other question. Uh, but yeah, this is this is our, our, our I guess, trichoidal uh, shader. Uh, and it does it does waves. Um, so I will leave links to to the, the resources that I used here, both from Unity and then uh, Freya and uh, and a few other people. Uh, and so you should go and go and check them out. And I will try to also include some code links to this, um, either on GitHub or just embedded in the description itself. I'm not entirely sure, but I think that's mostly it. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much this. Uh, other than that, I think the only other thing that I really wanted to call out is I know a lot of schools and a lot of colleges and a lot of things both here in the United States and outside the United States have, have been having a lot of issues with COVID-19 uh, and they've either shut down or temporarily suspended classes or, or whatever. Uh, if you are learning computer science or are, are trying to do, do something on yourself or you have some spare time and are looking into that uh, and you need some help figuring out something, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, there's a contact form on my YouTube page. Typically, that's for like business uses. Uh, but if it's something, if you if you need help with something, uh, either reach out to me there or on Twitter. My DMs are open there. Or join our Discord channel. We have a Discord channel that has a whole bunch of really good engineers there that can help you learn things. Um, but hopefully, uh, we can we can we can help each other out and, and learn some cool new things on the way. Uh, so th yeah, I guess that's that's what I wanted to say there. Uh, but yeah. That's this video, so I guess until next time, see internet.